listen to Dave Taylor ears get sore from West Virginia to Singapore. Miss her friends who ain't here no more. We'll see him over on the other shore. This episode of Dopey is brought to you by Aloe Recovery. Located in sunny Southern California in Malibu and Silver Lake, Aloe is a wonderful place that was started by our friend Bob Forrest, his friend Evan Haynes, and their friend Bob, and their other friend Jared. It was created to offer addicts a place where they're treated compassionately, and they want to treat addicts with compassion and not control. The idea is to unlock the mystery of addiction through reaching an addict rather than bullying an addict, which happens in so many other rehabs. They offer a very, very comfortable detox if you're coming off of alcohol or benzos or heroin. They treat co-occurring mental health disorders, including SMI, and they have amenities out the ass. They have equine therapy, surfing, sound bath meditation, and even the very spiritual sweat lodge. So if you need treatment, you feel like you're all fucked and you don't know where else to go, and you're willing to go to sunny Southern California, I would go to Aloe. All right, all you addicts and alcoholics in recovery, do you want to start looking for love in all the right places? Well, check out Clean and Sober Love, the dating app for people who choose this way of life. It was created by one addict helping another addict date safely. So here's the reality. You got clean and sober, you got a new life, and now you're ready to date. So where are you supposed to look? Clean and sober love is the solution. Dating and recovery is real and worth considering if your own house is in order. Clean and sober love is the platform where you can meet like-minded people all over the world. Install the app now on the App Store or Google Play Store. Oh, and by the way, it's completely free. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by listeners like you, the dopes in the Dopey Nation, through the power of the Dopey Patreon page. It's www.patreon.com slash dopeypodcast. If you love the show and you get something out of it, throw a buck, throw two bucks, throw 150 bucks, or throw nothing. I appreciate the support. I appreciate you guys being involved. If you want hats, if you want stickers, Venmo me. If you want any of the latest in dopey wear, go to www.dopeypodcast.com. Remember, next week is DopeyCon. Fucking send in a voicemail to dopeypodcast at gmail.com. Get ready. Get set. Hope your moonshine is ready and your crystal meth pipe is all shined up because it's the Appalachian episode of Dopey. The makers of Dopey do not condone drinking moonshine or smoking meth. Hi, Dopey Nation. My name is Quincy, and I am a longtime Dopey Nation member. I'm also a person in long-term recovery, and I serve on the board of Hope in the Hills. Our organization coordinates the Healing Appalachia concert that happened in West Virginia last weekend. The episode that you're about to hear captures Dave's experience traveling to West Virginia to MC Healing Appalachia 2019. Dave brought his particular blend of vulnerability and antagonism to the stage in the same way that he brings that to us every week on the podcast, and the crowd really responded to that. Um, It was a wonderful event, and it was a treat for me to see Healing Appalachia and Dopey come together in such a powerful way. I really enjoyed having some time with both Dave and Ray before the event and throughout the day as we all worked together backstage. We raised quite a lot of money for recovering addicts in Appalachia, and that was a true benefit to our cause Um, We had some amazing recovery speakers, even one of our own, Matt from the Dopey Nation, and it was wonderful to hear his story. So thanks, Dave, for making the trip. We really appreciate you coming down and supporting our work, and um, if anybody wants to attend next year, 
please mark your calendars for September 26, 2020. You can find more information on HealingAppalachia.org and Healing Appalachia on both Facebook and Instagram. Thanks to everybody in the Dopey Nation who bought a t-shirt, came to the event, donated money. We really appreciate all of that work. And once again, thanks to Dave for making it happen. Stay strong, Dopey Nation. And I'm going to split the difference with Toodles for Chris and Minase Toodles. So hello and welcome to Dopey, the podcast about drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. And I'm Dave. And somehow I'm sitting in a parked car in a fairground in West Virginia with my friend Ray. Welcome back to the show. Hi, Dave. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm not looking at you anyway. So why don't you tell the Dopey Nation how we got to this point in our lives here. How we're in the parking lot. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just tell this the morning to what we went to. Wait, before you do that, oh. I'm going to catch them up. We're at Healing Appalachia Recovery Festival in West Virginia featuring Tyler Childers and some Gibson Brothers, Gibson Brothers Sonora May. Some other people are playing. It's going to be fucking bananas. And somehow or other, uh, they asked me to be the MC, which is incredibly uh, crazy and... Uh, you know, I'm a little bit nervous, to be honest with you. I've, I've never spoken in front of more than, uh, I don't know, like 100 people. I don't even think I even spoke to 100 people. It's going to be great. I think the most people I've ever spoken to is like 50. I feel like that's the most people I've ever... What's the most people you ever spoke to? 500. So this is going to be like between five and 8,000. So like, I'm a little nervous, but at the same time, I feel okay. And, uh, and Ray and I are staying in this... Uh, Pretty nice hotel, the Hampton Inn. Hampton Inn. And we've been trying to record this segment of Dopey all day. So just so you guys know, this is the fourth time we've recorded it. I did not bring the traditional Dopey method of recording. We're recording on a Zoom portable recorder. It's the kind of thing that Mark Marin records on. This is what professionals use, which should tell you how professional I am. You're professional. Well, now I mean, now you are. But we have failed. But you're in a car for the fourth time. For the fourth time, we were late, so we finally came over here. And Ray, how are you feeling? I'm good. I'm ready for the festival. What do you think about the trip so far? It's been great. You've enjoyed it. It's been fun. Yeah. You know, before we started the the show, Ray said he's enjoying the trip, but he said that I'm incredibly annoying. No, I didn't. I said that's what I heard. You said I love you, and I said I love you too. And you said, "Do you think I'm annoying?" I said, "You have annoyed me on this trip." And, and, I'm, and I'm just flabbergasted. And you, said, you said, how have I annoyed you? And I said, when you lost the room key between the front desk and our room, which was 20 seconds. You're an ungrateful motherfucker, <laughs> I have to tell you. I had a room key. He had a room key. What does it matter if I lose the key? I mean, I, I, it turns out, though, I'm a very difficult person. Like, they invited... Hur- Hurricane Dave. They invited me to go to this thing, and, like, me and Linda were supposed to go, but we couldn't pull it off. And I asked my friend Sam to go, and I asked maybe somebody else to go. Maybe I might have asked another person to Now I'm the sixth <laughs> And then I said to myself, <laughs> who do I know that has so little going on that he could pack everything up and just go? At the last minute, who's unemployed? Who, what unemployed loser do I know? And then number one on my list is my buddy Ray. And uh, we get to the airport, right? And, uh, and Ray has a backpack, and he's wearing a shirt and a uh, jacket. And I have a backpack with my shirt and jacket, but I also have a portable roll-away bag. A giant suitcase. It's not giant. It's not even big. It's a carry-on. <laughs> but Ray says, what are you bringing all that luggage for? And I, I have some gear. I have, I have the recording gear. I have... Dopey uh, hats. I have dopey hats. I have dopey buttons. I have dopey stickers. And... Um, I brought a couple things just in case. I brought sweatpants. I brought a bathing suit. I brought this and that. And then I remembered uh, something about Ray is that Ray's a, a, he's a very idio- idiosyncratic kind of guy. And I he, was going to bring a toothbrush. I brought a little more than a toothbrush. but I didn't bring a toothbrush. I brought my toothbrush at, yeah. at uh, 7-Eleven. I travel. I go to Europe. I bring a uh, passport and a toothbrush. And I think this reflects the most important story of the day, which is, Years ago, Ray once told me about how he washes his clothes. And I think that this is built into the minimalistic simplicity, simplicity of Ray. It's almost like a Buddhist thing. 
Would you consider yourself a Buddhist? I, yes, I'm Buddhist. It's like imagine if in India they washed their clothes in the Ganges, but they didn't get out of their clothes. They do that. No, they don't. They do. I've no, been they d- to the Ganges. And they wash themselves in the river they with their drink clothes? They the water and they brush your teeth with it. But do they wash their clothes? They're, while- they're in there with the clothes on. The point of the story is that Ray, years ago, and I thought he was doing shtick when he told me this, he washes his clothes in the bathtub while whilst wearing them. Well, I get in the shower with my clothes on and... I have one pair of clothes, which I'm wearing now. It's, it would be a set of a set. clothes. I have two sets. And I, I've it's, seen, it's a, listen, I can think of three or four outfits I've Le- seen you in. Levi's and a Dave shirt. Which is ironic because we were both wearing a Dave and shirt. We were both wearing Dave. And I get in the shower and I soap my body up with the clothes on. And then I take my clothes off and I stomp on them in the shower to rinse them out. I still don't believe He's told me this like four times and I still don't believe it. Dopey Nation, Ray gets in the and, shower. And then I hang them up to dry. He gets in the shower wearing his clothes. And then he Not washes. every time, like once a month. You do the laundry once a month. Yes. And you wear the clothes as you wash them. Yes. So every other shower is sit naked. Yes. And you don't. You never wash just your underwear in the shower or just a t-shirt. You're I've like, done that you're too. like, I need, I have to wear this I'm dress done, shirt. So you I've take a dress that. shirt yes. out of the laundry, you put it on. So you've, have you ever used a washing machine? And I'm being serious. Yes, I've used a washing machine. And you don't find that's more effective? It's more expensive. Dude, tell me when you get an actually laundered outfit, you're like, holy shit, this smells so good. It's nice. The clothes are so fresh. <laughs> So why, Ray, you, you have a job, like, you make money, I, like, I, I, you have money in the bank. It's like $20 to drop your laundry off. Well, don't drop it off, go do it. It's very difficult in Manhattan. You are a, an unbelievable character. Now, this makes me think, the Dopey Nation is mostly like low-bottom junkies and crackheads and stuff. Do any of you guys wash your clothes with your clothes on? Do you think any of them do it, Ray? Have you ever met anybody else that does no, it? No, I've never met anyone that does it. If any of you guys do that, uh, write me at uh, dopeypodcast at gmail.com. And also tell me if you think that this is an acceptable form of washing your clothes or an unacceptable form. But I, I, I mean, it's one of the most amazing things I've ever heard about Ray. And another thing that's amazing about Ray is he's been on the show before. He actually, one of the most amazing things about Ray is... Uh, I think it was after, no, it was before Chris died. It was for the 100th episode, I think. And I said, Ray, can you do a dopey song? And like that night, he like sent me this amazing fucking dopey song. This dopey, dopey podcast that's coming in your ear. Heroin and ketamine, methamphetamine and beer. And then he said, Dave and the other guy, you know, the hot one. Everybody wants to fuck. And then Dave was like, why am I not the hot one? Yeah, why am I? Because Chris is the hot one. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> Chris was just younger and better looking than me. Besides that, you know. We could have both been the hot one. I'm going to sing that song at DopeyCon. I know. If you're at DopeyCon, you'll, see, you'll hear Ray sing the it's song. sold out. You know, there's a bunch of people who thought that I was the hot one, just so you know. Okay. You don't believe that? You're the hot one. Yeah, you're the hot one. Wow. <laughs> anyway. We'll move along here because now I'm, I'm, my feelings are hurt. Um, we got invited to this very, very special dinner last night. You've told me before you thought I was hot. Yes. Dave is very hot. For those of you, you behind the dopey uh, things over his eyes, he's very hot. Dave has beautiful eyes. Yeah, they're, miss, they're, they're, missing, they're missing my best quality. Yes, you've covered up your best quality. Well, that, that's interesting. And then my, my hook giant nose doesn't help <laughs> anything. And then everything else, everything else doesn't help either. Um, so last night we got invited to this incredible dinner. After we'd had this long journey, which, which I thought Dave was going to drive because I've had problems driving recently. And I was, he was going to drive. And then I asked him, you're a good driver, right? We're in the airport. We're getting the rental car. And he says... He says, Dave, you're a good driver, right? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I wouldn't say I was a good driver, yep. but uh, yeah, I can drive. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, 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 I'd say I'm okay. It was worse than that. <laughs> no, I mean, like, if anybody knows me, you know that like, people assume I'm a much worse driver than I am. My daughter thinks I'm a great driver. Okay. And I drive around a lot. Well, anyway, so I drove the whole way. Well, Ray I- also said, he said, Dave, I think you can drive, but 
Uh, no, I'll, I'll leave. Jump. I'll leave the the airport. But if there's any bridges to go over, I need you to go over the bridges. Yes. Because Ray suffers from this very rare uh, vertigo disease. If I drive over a bridge, I pass out. Well, you didn't. He drove over at least three bridges on this trip. I drove four or five hours. I passed semis. I drove over bridges. I'm, Dude, I'm curious. Just to not let me drive you, it's like <laughs> I fucking I will beat this disease. We, you're cured I'm just cured. To, just so I wouldn't drive you, which is amazing. So this woman, Quincy, who invited us to the festival, invited us to dinner last night, and Ray and I were so fucking tired. We got, and we got to the really nice hotel room. We're like, we just want to crash. Ray was like, can't we eat at Shoney's, man? I didn't say that. He's like, yo, dude, can't we just go to Shoney's? But Ray, Quin- Ray was dying for Taco Bell and Shoney's. Taco Bell. I didn't but, realize that you really like crave it. I love Taco Bell. It's like, I, I didn't really realize it. Now that we've recorded this bit four times, <laughs> it's like I've learned so much about you that when you eat junk food, um, it's like you're a vegetarian who thrives on junk food. Yes. And that's, a, that's an interesting phenomenon Don't. because you'd think a vegetarian is in it for the health. No. So you're like, fuck that shit. So what makes you, why are you Dunk, a vegetarian? Dunkin' Donuts, hash browns. Those are so good. But so Quincy's place is up in the mountains. You're not interested in talking about your vegetarianism? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm like, I eat healthy sometimes, but I do like, like I go to Dairy Queen for their onion rings, which is so good. Yeah, you pointed out a few Dairy Queens on the way. <laughs> it's so good. What else? Um, what, other, what other fast food, uh, uh, junk food, vegetarian stuff do you recommend to the Dopey Nation? I like it all. Anything, you know, pizza. Ray, Joe, Joe's Pizza on 14th Street. Ray's like, I recommend French fries and pizza. Yes. Um, but so Quincy had asked me on the phone, like, what do you eat? You know, and I said, I eat everything. But I think that now that we've done this thing four times, we're confused at what we've said or what we haven't said. Are you? Uh, Did we tell them about the, the house versus the hotel? Oh, yeah. We were, uh, we were originally offered. Well, Dave said, I said, where are we going to stay? It's like that. The Airbnbs are kind of expensive. And Dave was like, they've given us this farmhouse. I'm like, cool, I'm down. I, I'm definitely down. And then I looked at the farmhouse, and it's like way up in the mountains, and there's bears and snakes all around it. And I was concerned about Dave, so I called Dude, him. Dude, wait, wait, wait. You, you, were, you were not concerned about me. What he was? Con- oh, there's no internet yeah. and no cell service. Ray was like, I'm Ray, Ray is stuck, in this group. Ray I'm going to be stuck in a house with Dave with no distractions. He's in this private fucking Facebook group called Flow Chan that he's addicted to. He's addicted to the Chan like I'm addicted to my phone. And uh, he's constantly like taking pictures of himself for Flow Chan. One time I saw him on the street in Manhattan. It was pretty, it was a pretty beautiful moment actually. He was going into Dwayne Reed's to buy himself a, a, a two gallon thing of Friendly's ice cream, the flavor ray. Forbidden chocolate. Forbidden chocolate. Then we get out of the Dwayne Reed, and he says, Dave, let me take a picture of you with the ice cream for Flo Chan. And Flo Chan doesn't know about my uh, chocolate addiction. It was just for Flo Chan. Yeah. They, it had nothing to do with me. It was Ray and Flo Chan. So Ray, when he heard that this farmhouse didn't have internet or cell service, he was like, what do I do without the Chan? <laughs> He's like, I can't. He's like, Dave, I can't do it. And then I panicked because I knew I couldn't make this trip alone. I was not going to manage alone. You ne- Dave never would have made this trip without me. Ray fucking booked the flights. He booked the car. He memorized the map of the town. And, uh, and he's basically run everything. He, didn't, he couldn't figure out this, this recording device. So we, we were going to the dinner, and we were like... You're desperate to get to this dinner we, story, aren't you? We, uh, we try, we've had trouble with this recording device, and I'm not a technical guy. So we asked Sam in California to help us. And he did. He did. It works now. Now we fixed it. So we're going to this dinner. and I'm, oh, I'm, It's like 30 minutes away. Ray is begging me to cancel. I'm not and I beg- said, Ray, I'm in recovery. I can't cancel this kind of thing. I, and I, I couldn't cancel. She also said she was going to make something. I knew it was going to be special. I kind of thought it would be good. You know, and we met them and they were so lovely. Uh, well, we, Quincy so we're and her driving partner. up the mountain and it's just getting... More and more scary. And we're in a rental car, which is in my name, and we're on this, like, mountain trail, Jeep trail road, and we don't know where we're going. There's no GPS. It's getting scary, but the worst thing is it's getting dark. And it's the, it's the, the mountains in West Virginia. You know, like, it's, it, the night is falling. The road is disappearing. We're going up this hill past all of these many pastures, and it's just like... It's intense, you know, especially for two we city turn, guys. We couldn't turn around. Well, eventually, 
we passed a, a marker which said slow down for children, goats, and grannies. And that's when we knew we were in the right path. But then we had to make another left, and it was onto a dirt path, as Ray would call it, a Jeep path. And, uh, and that's when Ray is like, Dave, I don't think we can turn around we on could. this road. I said, let's keep going. I grew up Everything's on, fine. I grew up in the country on a dirt road. He said, Dave, I, I checked the farmer's almanac, and there's no moon out tonight. There's no moon. He's like, I think we're going to struggle. And, I, and like GPS is going out. My dad is texting me. Quincy's texting me. And I'm feeling a little bit nervous. You know, Quincy's texting like, are you all right? And Dave didn't want to respond because he would lose the GPS. But we made it there. We had the most delicious meal. It was incredible. It was literally in the top five meals of my life. Yeah, I think it was the best meal I've ever had. Do you really think that? Yeah. It was fucking insane. Yeah. She, she, she sits us down and uh, she starts uh, sauteing these uh, sweet potato leaves um, with garlic, garlic and, and butter. It smelled so good. And, uh, and then Ray looks at me. He kind of nudged me. He kind of gave me this look because he knew uh, how good this thing was going to be. And then um, we sit down. She takes out this fresh bread and she goes, oh, there's some garlic ghee on the table. And she just presents us with just dish like after dish. Curry of squash. Curried squash. With chickpeas. Chickpeas with, with curry. Beans. These string beans with kind of garlic and this fresh baked bread. And, and we had a... Great conversation. It, was very, it sounded like a dopey podcast. Well, Quincy's hardcore in recovery, yeah. and she hopefully she'll come on today. We're going to record a whole show at the festival. Um, and we talked about dopey, which is always fun for me to talk about. It's very cool to meet somebody who uh, knows about the show and I never met, so it's almost as though we knew each other. Although we did have a bunch of phone conversations before. But it was still very cool, and her partner was cool. And, uh, and I kind of rushed us out of there. But before I did, Quincy was like, wait, don't you want dessert? And I was like, and she knows that I wanted dessert. So I was like, yes. And she brings to the table literally possibly the best dessert I've ever had yeah. in my life. It was very simple. It was, she, she bought peanut butter from Whole Foods and she brought uh, dark chocolate fucking uh, That's morsels, that, semi-sweet. Dark chocolate. I think semi-sweet morsels, organic, peanut butter, organic chocolate, and she whipped them into some fucking... Like kisses. Like some swirls. like... Swirls. Yeah, some swirly, very... And it was cold and hard and still soft at the same time. So good. Just perfect consistency, and I wanted to eat like a billion, and I ate like most of them. Might have been better than the dinner. I don't know. It was a tough. So good. And like we are, I think we were also starving going up the hill. So like <laughs> the anxiety and being hungry was mixed in together. And we talked a bunch about sobriety, and it made me think about uh, Ray's sobriety. And uh, he didn't admit this at Quincy's house, but this morning he told me a little story because I asked him how long he'd been sober for. And and I know Ray. Ray like is like not a big meeting goer, and Ray like Ray was a terrible alcoholic. And, uh, and drug user. Um, and I actually was part of Ray's uh, recovery story. Dave was the first person I reached out to. Amazing. It took a while, but I was on the train and I texted him about this. And uh, it took a while. We and had a deep, long conversation. I remember I said, listen. And I don't think you were sober. When, when we had the conversation. You were weed. No, when I, we had the conversation, I was sober. Oh, okay. um, and I said, I said, well, if you want to drink, it's not like... It's not going to be there for you. Remember, I was like, you walk past every bodega, you can always oh, yeah. decide to drink. Right. Because you, cause you kind of had this idea like, I'll never be able to oh, drink again. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember I was sitting on Linda's, uh, like, her porch, and I remember, like, it was so cool because Ray and I had known each other from, like, this uh, open mic place where we both played music, and we sort of, like, over the course of many years became friends. But it was like a, it was a cool developing mm-hmm. friendship. And like, I was very touched that he wanted to talk to me about it. And uh, I was happy that I could help. Then eventually, I found a sponsor and we would go. That's why I, I kind of stopped going to meetings because we would go to meetings together all the time. But then this girl recently asked me to speak at her meeting. And she asked me how many years I had. It was a requirement. I think it was a minimum years. And I said, I don't know. According to whom? Because according to AA, I have one year. Because according to me, I have five years, but I did MDMA in Dublin last June. I think according to everybody, that counts as a relapse. <laughs> so, Just so you, and, and even to you, yeah. it's just like you well, know that's a relapse. Well, you know she did. So what? You didn't start drinking, but you know tripping on MDMA is not sobriety. And she's hold on. And she wait, wait, did not ask me to speak at her meeting. I, that makes sense. <laughs> it's a smart, smart woman. But hold on, I'm just going to ask you this. Listen, do you think tripping ecstasy? 
in Ireland is sober? Uh, yes, yes, no? yes, I do. How? Because it didn't. I didn't start drinking. I didn't take any that's not, more drugs. That's not, the, that's not what the question is. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't ask, okay, here. Did it you? Works, did you? It works for hold me. Hold on. Did you start drinking after you took ecstasy? No. Um, did you start taking drugs afterwards? No. But did you trip face and lose your mind yes. and get high on yes. it? Yes. So were you sober okay, when you took I ecstasy? I have one year and three months. All right. I mean, I'm just, I mean, listen, I don't care. It's not like I'm judging right. you. But it's she, just reality is you this, weren't sober when you're tripping MDMA. This girl said, I think the more important thing is, did you tell your sponsor? And I said, no. And then I saw my sponsor the next day and I told him, and he's like, whatever. Dude, the, the more important thing is that you're on a great path. And I don't need to tell you that. I know you're on a great path. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not like I'm not telling you you're on a great path. I just know you. And I also know that you were high on MDMA. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, so I don't care. It's like, it's one day at a time. It's whatever. You know? I've, I've been to Ireland seven times in the past and four years. And you tripped ecstasy every I've time? I've never drank beer. I've never drank whiskey. Have you whiskey, tripped ecstasy every time? But I have sampled the MDA, MDMA of the Emerald Isle. And they, what do they call it there? Yolks. Do they say we're yoking it? No, but they say you got any yolks or like a bag of yolks. They don't say we're yoking it up. I've never heard that. When you go back and you trip MDMA, say, yo, I'm yoking it up. <laughs> I'm going to start a new word. Anyway, we got the festival all day. I'm hoping we get some good dopey stories. We just heard one. It's going to be a shitload of addicts. I'm going to try to MC this thing the best I can. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Shout out. Stay strong, dopey nation. Yes, sir. So we're here, we're at the fucking Appalachian Healing Festival in Lewisburg, West Virginia, and I did my, my opening thing. Did you see me do the opening thing? It, yeah. was, it wasn't great. It wasn't great. You didn't miss much. But <laughs> here I am, though, first addict of the day. It's our new friend Critter, a.k.a. Skin. Welcome to Dopey. Hey, it's, it's good to be here. And he's got a real serious West Virginian accent, so that's good for the show. <laughs> makes us seem more worldly. It's good. So, so we're actually, the, the studio for Dopey today is in our, what kind of car is this, Ray? Hyundai. It's not a Hyundai, it's a Nissan. It's a Nissan. Nissan what? Sonata. I think it's a Sonata. Nissan Sonata? Cilantro. 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 <laughs> Nissan Cilantro? Do you know what it's Cilantro. called? <laughs> it's not Cilantro, that's a spice. Anyway, we're in the Nissan studio. The Gibson brothers are playing off in the background. And I got Critter in the front seat. Welcome to the show again. It's good to be here. Thank you. And the, the plan today is to collect dopey stories. And Critter says he has a whopper of a tale. Yes, I do. Yes, definitely. Um, I think I was 18, just turned 18 years old, actually. Um, was at Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia. Okay. And uh, it's like halfway through my first semester and. um of course, I didn't do much studying when I was there. Uh huh. You know, I was out there quite a bit. Um, what were you up to? A little bit of everything. Okay. Uh, what was, was your favorite stuff? I was extremely uh, drunk at this time. Though. Okay. Uh, and uh, I like the green and me too. You know, yeah. But uh, I got really, really drunk, and I had this date with a beautiful blonde. Okay. You know, best looking legs I ever seen. Okay, and uh, I blacked out, and we were at the uh, the warehouse was the name of the club, and uh, I was majoring in sports medicine. Okay, I actually had a scholarship and all, um, but for some reason, when I got really drunk like that, I would like to incite riots and fights <laughs> <laughs> full on mayhem right okay but uh because you would drink and you black out and oh yeah total yeah. madness um i had a lot of uh classes with the football team in 1992 which that was probably one of the best teams they had you know since the plane crash in the 70s but um troy brown well-known professional I don't know anything NFL about it, but that doesn't mean anything. I'm just but, uh, uneducated. I started a bunch of fights in this bar, and uh, they kicked me out. And I really don't remember. My best friend Dave, he, he told me more about it, but also I made the front page of the news, uh, the 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock news, the newspaper and everything. Um, so what happened? You, get, you start a fight with a bunch of football players. Well, I was starting fights with other people, and the football players were taking up for me. Okay, that's good. <laughs> it beats fighting with them, right? Right. 
Um, but somewhere during the night, uh, I didn't really know what I'd done for a week later. The only thing I can remember is a cop saying, get out of the truck, son, this is not your truck. And uh, was trying to get me to blow in the breathalyzer, and I, I couldn't even talk. So uh, I wake up, I'm in jail. And I'm like, what the fuck am I doing in here? I've never been to jail before, you know. And uh, I saw my name on this chalkboard. And, You're like, what the fuck happened? Right. I'm looking around, there's all these people in there, and I'm like, man, when do you think they're going to let me out of here? He's like, when would you come in? I said, it says on that board right there, 7 o'clock this morning. And he was like, oh, you'll be out of here by Wednesday, Thursday. I said, oh, oh no, 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 no. I was like, I got class on Monday, man. I got to get the fuck out of here. And um, finally they took us to the magistrate, and, you know, he released us. And uh, I still, they didn't tell me what I did. I was just figuring it was public intoxication. And but to be in till Wednesday, that seems kind of like intense right. for just public intoxication. Yeah. But so when did when did you hear I, what had happened? Uh, and how did you find out? Actually, I got out that evening. And when I got out, one of my buddies found out that I was in jail. He came and picked me up. And we got when we were on our way back to the dorm, he's like, your mom's here looking for you. And You're I'm like, like, oh, shit. Oh, my God. You know, and uh, I get there and my mom's all tore up because her younger sister had died the night before. Oh, my God. And, uh, like, one of the only things I can remember about that night was something was in my head like I needed to get home. Because you had heard your aunt had died. And, no, I I didn't know. I mean, I was just so drunk. And the only thing I can remember about that night in my brain is, like, I I wanted to go home. And uh, You just had a feeling like you had to be there. Yeah. And just so happened there's an ambulance sitting outside of Holderby Hall in Huntington with the lights on, sirens, fly, lights flashing, siren on. The people were upstairs getting somebody. Trying to save somebody's life. Yeah. <laughs> That's, and yeah. I go up and get in the ambulance and drove off. Because you had to go home. Yeah. Because you had some psychic premonition that you, right. you were needed at home. And I made it like 40 yards down the wrong way of College Avenue on a one way and uh ended up on the sidewalk i don't think i hit the telephone pole but i like stopped up wow. on the sidewalk with it and uh i remember this cop was telling me this but i didn't put all this together until i went home for my aunt's funeral i come back to school a week later i checked my mailbox and i had a letter from marshall university judicial board I'm like, oh, my God, I done got kicked out of school. Did you? No. Okay. But I went went to this, uh, talked to this lady, and, um, like, there was a few people there. And she was getting, you know, everybody was in trouble that were there. And uh, I'm like, God, what did I do? And she calls me in, and she's like, is your name such and such? I was like. Yeah. Is your name Critter, a.k.a. Yeah, Skin? Right. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, so you're the one who stole the ambulance. Look, my my heart just dropped, man. I, it was like taking off in an airplane. I'm like, oh, my God. Me and Sam, <laughs> right? It's like, you, you, and it's like to hear the story, yeah. and it wasn't even you, right. but it was. It was me, yeah. That's crazy. Like, Did you, um, like, was that the lowest it went for you? Actually, that was just the beginning of a of a lifetime low, you know. Uh, I've had so much stuff happen to me after that, but that's pretty much like... That was the entree to the total... Yeah, I still have the newspaper clippings with my name and everything in it. Right. You know. Uh, and now you're sober at this festival, though. Oh, yeah. So that's yes. a positive thing. December, I'll have three years. That's right on. You know? And... Um, what was the thing? I loved hearing about what's the the thing that brought you to recovery in the end. Actually, what really brought me here was uh, I got in trouble. What was the trouble? Uh, or if you don't want to talk about Operating it. a clandestine meth lab, manufacturing methamphetamine. See, this is a dopey story here. This is, uh, <laughs> you know. So what yes. happened? Uh, you, were, you, were, you, were, you were cooking up meth? Yeah. In this state? Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
And, and were you like, where, what was the lab like? Tell us about it. I know, I, the only thing I know about cooking meth is I know about smoking meth, shooting meth, and watching Breaking Bad. Well, so, I did that all that. Yeah, okay. Like, I was cooking it like he did on Breaking Bad. Yeah? Red sulf, red phosphorus, yeah. You were like watching the show, check, check, check. <laughs> oh, Are you yeah. excited for the Jesse movie that's about to come out? They're, oh, they're, yeah, really? There's a movie coming out in October about what happens to Jesse when he escapes. Yeah, I'd it's like called to see El that. Camino. Okay, but tell us about a little bit about life as a fucking meth cook. Were you a Look, chef, a cook? What'd you call yourself? A cook. Okay, talk about it. Let's well, hear about um, it. I mean, I learned from a a very experienced person. He actually resembled the guy on Breaking Bad. Heisenberg, lot. Walter yes. White, yes, Walter White. So it was some old nerdy guy who was like, "I want to teach you the way." Yeah. Or were you a meth? Were you a meth addict when he when yeah. he found you? Yeah. So it's a real kind of right. Wow. He just had got out of prison. You know, he. Uh, I lived in Florida, and he learned to cook meth like in Alabama. Right. Traveling all around and shit, and he heard there was a guy that which was me that liked to party, and I had this room in my house, so. He agreed to, uh, I agreed to let him come there, and in turn, he teach me how to do it, you know. It was like some crazy criminal apprenticeship, right? basically, and you learned the whole thing. Yep. And I got really paranoid, freaked out in Florida, like, they're coming to get me. Of course. So I came back to West Virginia, and maybe for a couple months I was all right, and then uh, I started back into it here when you weren't doing it were you like i missed did you miss using it or did you miss making it and the action of selling it and being that guy actually the action of making it right it was the a, process it was so like incredibly exciting right. that you were creating this thing yeah. it's almost like magic yeah you know because you're creating this thing right. i mean i used to think a lot about like when i took drugs it was like magic because it was like instantaneous effect Right. You know, chemistry is very much like magic. So, so like you really. So, what what clicked in your head when you wanted to uh, to get back into cooking? You were bored or something. That, and I got tired of uh, I got tired of buying it. I was like, fuck yes, man. I, you know, and uh, I was with this girl though, and uh, which I knew in my mind, I was like, it's not gonna work. You know, I'm gonna get caught. Yeah, you can't, I don't know how anyone cannot get caught yeah, using meth and making it. It's like a recipe yeah. for total failure. Right. It was, but it's also an opportunity to get out of it. Yeah, At the, you know, the the worse you get, you know, yeah. as long as you don't die, right, you have the opportunity to get out of it. You know, the cop that got me, he had been after me for years for some, for anything, and couldn't get me, and he finally did. How did he get you? Uh, actually. The guy that I was, the house I was, the guy I was fooling with, man, he uh, he had gotten some trouble that I didn't know about and kind of... He gave you up? Yeah. All right, that sucks. And they got me at his house and shit. And, I, and the guy's you know, like, you don't know who you have here. Right. It, it was crazy, man. And uh, I, I was facing like 25 years in prison. So what happened? Uh, I took a plea to conspiracy and they dropped the manufacturing and operating a lab and got into drug court program. I hear really good things about the drug court it, program. Uh, really, I, they cop and the drug court program probably saved my life. So tell us like, tell us about, uh, I mean, that's an incredible story in general. Um, Cause I never met anybody who uh, actually made, made meth before. And like, it became such like a, you know, such like a media thing. I was like addicted to making it. How? What, what was that like? You know, it was a rush. It was, it was a big rush. And everybody was like, "Yo, he's got that fire shit yeah. and all that kind of right. stuff." Yeah, it's weird, like that a- aspect of addiction, like yeah. the acceptance because you're a drug dealer or a drug mm. manufacturer in your situation. Manufacturing, that's that's crazy. Wow. Well, critter, I appreciate you telling the story. Oh yeah. Oh, dude. Um, when you went to drug court. Tell tell us the Dopey Nation. That's the guys who listen. We call them the Dopey Nation. Tell them what changed in your head. Like, how did the, your perspective change? You're sitting here with three plus years clean and sober. You seem like a happy person. Yeah. Like, what changed? Like, when I got there, you know, I had to put. A, I had a lot of get a lot of structure back in my life. I never had structure in my life. You know, I had to be home at a certain time. 
And you knew if you didn't do it, you were was, fucking in jail. Yeah, I was going to jail. You know, so when did crazy. it change? Because I bet in the beginning you're like, I'm going to do what they say so I don't mm-hmm. serve time. When did it click in, or did you want it to click in real bad? I think I really wanted it, you know, because my entire, I mean, I was in active addiction 30-plus uh, years. Yeah. You know, uh, I think I just had enough finally. Right. Uh, so, so when somebody comes up to you, like, uh, you know, somebody who can't get their shit together and you look at them, and you and like I don't know. I mean, I know what changed in my life had a lot to do with my kids, yeah. my kid, my my woman, whatever. Like the the consequences of being this fuck right. up like became like a burden to yeah. me. Like what what do you? I mean, but when somebody asks me like what can they do, I like always say I don't know. I would say go to a meeting. I say yeah. talk to somebody. Try to get some time because in time you can change perspective. Right. At first, it's not easy. No, you, I, and I tell them like you know you have to want to do it for yourself. Right. It, it cannot be for anybody no. else, or it won't work. You know, even I, being in drug court, I've seen a lot of people fail. Right. A lot of younger people, but I also have to look at the fact that. When I was their age, I would have never done it. Me neither. You know, I couldn't do it. Right. But how about the young people who get clean? Aren't they? A I trip? love it, man. It's, it's so it's, wild it's when you see that. Yeah. Yes, I have it's amazing. A, a really close person to me. My, he's actually my cousin. Okay, we went through drug, drug court together, and uh, he's twenty five years old. Just turned twenty five. But I bet you were a big inspiration to that. And you know, he's three. He he'll be three years clean too. That's awesome. And uh, I tell him every time I get a chance, you know, I'm like, dude, I, I'm really proud of you. And that's beautiful. You know, you're doing something that, and you're an inspiration to other young people. You know, I, I resent young people who get clean. I like get, <laughs> I like get angry. Like, what the uh, fuck? Like, right? when, when I remember when I went back to a meeting, there was some dude with like, he had like 10 years and he was 29. Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck is this? I know. You know, right. and like, it's like. But it's, it, but it is great if yeah. somebody can fucking have it click. I, I just, it's amazing. Right. But thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. What a, we start with stealing an ambulance, and we end up with manufacturing meth and, and a beautiful <laughs> life and recovery. Right. Ray, you got anything to add on this thing? Great story, Critter. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Critter. Appreciate thank it, you. man. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So we're at the Appalachian Healing Festival still. We just had, do you know Critter? Yes, I know. Skin. <laughs> yes, I know skin. <laughs> so Critter just told uh, some crazy fucking stories involving meth labs and ambulance theft and such. And right now we found Taylor while the Gibson brothers are rocking out. You guys might be able to hear them. We're in like this air conditioned green room (laughs) behind the green room. It's dark, but very comfortable, right? Yes, it's very comfortable. Hold the mic very close to your mouth or they won't hear you and everyone will yell at me that you didn't talk about. (laughs) So tell us, um, Taylor, about, you know, your your dopey story. Give us a dopey story. Okay. Well, I got a couple, but the one that... You're from West Virginia? Yeah, of course. Okay, I'll start from the top. So my name's Taylor and... Oh, you're going to use your whole name? Oh, I don't care. You don't care? Yeah. You're not going to email me and say to take it down because people do that all the time? No, 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 no. It's all good. Um, so yeah, my name's Taylor and I'm 26 years old. Okay. And, um, so basically... I'm David, I'm 45. Oh, right. nice to meet Thank you, David. You. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so basically let me start with one of the best stories. I, okay, so there's a new movie out called Hustlers. Have yeah, you, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so the whole gist of that story is basically strippers taking money from wealthy men that they think that they deserve. So during the first... Five or six years of my hardcore addiction run, I literally, I was a stripper. Okay. For about seven years. And I... So when did you start doing that? I started stripping, I don't know who listens to this. Lots of people (laughs) listen. But... We'll say say nobody. uh, Well, listen, no, no, no. So when I was 17, I actually decided uh, I was going to sneak into a club in Virginia Beach and... See what you could do. Yeah, and I did it. Had you practiced and stuff? No. You were unprepared. I was completely unprepared. It was something that... It just kind of happened naturally, and... What happened first, the, the dancing or the drugs? Well, the drugs were... They had it, they hadn't peaked yet. Right. It was on and off, and then the dancing started. What was the thought? You were like, "What the fuck? I can do this." Yeah. What was the thought? Fuck, I'm broke. I'm broke, and and I'm hot, <laughs> and they'll pay me. Exactly. Was that, that was the thought. Okay. Yeah. Fuck, I'm broke. Um, I need money, and hey, I know somebody that a girl that makes money. So, so basically, I went in there, started dancing, and um, yeah. So like the whole movie Hustlers, I feel like. I'm really connected with that movie. Except, I didn't see it. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so basically I would 
not drug men, but get them very drunk with me. And we would do some other mind altering like substances. What? Tell me what else to Molly, do. MDMA. So you trip ecstasy with these customers. Uh, yeah. You get them drunk, and then you'd give them Molly, or they'd buy the Molly off you. What was the What was the we'd arrangement? We give it to them. Okay. Yeah. That would soften them up. Oh yeah, and then we'd max out their credit cards. Wow. On what, what kind of stuff? Yeah. So basically, we'd uh, start off light with some lap dances, and get them all buttered up. Yes. Did you actually apply butter to yourself, or that's just an expression? Mm, no. It's just an it, get, it gets pretty hot and sweaty in there yeah. whenever you're dancing okay. in nine-inch heels. Okay, and I can't Nothing even... but a G-string. <laughs> I know what it's like. It's not an easy life. It's yes. not an easy uh-huh. life at all. But, yeah, that was uh, that's where I started to peak during my drug use, And, what, and what happened, like, addiction-wise? Addiction-wise, it was a spiral downfall, like a snowball effect. So you were making yeah. all this money. I was greedy, and I was making a shit ton of money, and I didn't know what to do with this money because I was terrible at managing money at the age of 18. So I thought that buying drugs was number one. Good? I'm sorry. Oh. I'm just nervous about the band. No, 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 no. You're good. You're good. But yeah, and it, it in, eventually ended up to me getting fired from a couple clubs because they realized we were giving these fools drugs in the back whenever, you That know. was like the way to, to make money off of these people. Oh, uh, yeah. I but mean, like, how did it go hand in hand with your addiction? Like, you're, you're fucking stripping and you're basically stealing and, 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 and getting these guys fucked up on ecstasy. Did they know? I mean, I'm sure they did the next I'm sure morning they when they woke out, up and they felt like and high, shit. Yeah. yeah, and they're like, "Fuck, why? Why is this? Why is my bank account in the negatives?" And how did yeah. how did your addiction get turned on in that situation? Turned on is because I had a stupid, endless amount of money. And what did you go and to? Like, you started on ecstasy, or ecstasy, started on coke? and then uh, um, I didn't. I wanted the feeling of. I was trying to suppress a feeling of not having to get naked and rub on old men. So I'm like, hey, let me try some heroin and I can just like nod out and kind of rub on them and still make the same amount of money. And because I, you weren't really enjoying what you were doing. No. At one point from like 18 to 21, I was like, hell yeah, this is awesome. This is like cool. This is cool. And then when it got to the point where I was like, yeah, this fucking sucks. I hate coming to my gross. job every day. This is retarded. Like I want a husband. And then I was like, well, I'm never going to find a husband, so let me just, like, do some... Find heroin. Heroin. It begins with an H also. (laughs) Heroin was my husband for a while. It's terrible. But, no, yeah, heroin definitely... Once I met him, he was... He rocked my fucking world for, like... No, me too. I had had the same same issue. About four and a half years. He he was my husband for four and a half years, and uh, I got to the point where I I filed a lawsuit against a, a club here locally in West Virginia... Because he, I was so fucked up on drugs that this man had stolen seventy five thousand dollars from me. Well, that's kind of karma, right? Because you had stolen yes, all this fucking yes. money. Th- that's that's what I and was getting the dude, to. And then the dude, then the dude, fucking, yeah. how did he pull it off? He gave you ecstasy and got you drunk, and then he, no, what did he it, do? It, it's a, actually a crazy story. It was a uh, a club owner in West Virginia. I dated him for a really long time, and he was taking advantage of me. He was feeding me drugs, but he, I was like his. Uh, his pusher, his worker. Like, I worked. I made him a shit ton of money because I was... He was like, he pimped you out, basically. Basically, without having sex with right. people. Yeah, he yeah, pimped except me for out. him. <laughs> yeah. Right. Basically, that's I how it went. Yeah. And then once I got... I had got arrested for, I think, a DUI. And so I spent, like, a couple weeks in jail. And once I got out, uh, this lawyer started calling me from out of state. And he's like, hey, like, yada, 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 this is what's going on. He's stealing money from all you girls. And, like... The lawyer calculated it up for me, and it's like, boom, $75,000. And that's when shit kind of hit the fan. I got banned from all the strip clubs in West Virginia. <laughs> so so what happened then? I, I got half of my money back, and I'm banned from all the establishment, establishments in West Virginia, and he owns every single one of them in West Virginia. But that's probably a blessing. It was a blessing in disguise, literally. I haven't danced in almost two and a half years. And I work full time. I'm a cosmetologist there you and go. an esthetician. And when did you get so, clean? I got clean September second, twenty seventeen. And like, how did? What was the the end of the run? Like, how did it happen? Me sitting in jail. And you were just like, "Fuck, fuck this, this shit. I'm done." And then uh, my son. And during that whole progression of stripping in six years, I had met my son's father, and I have a beautiful six-year-old son now. You do? I saw him. He's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, he's awesome, and he's literally... My whole perspective on life has changed. I love getting up every day, and being able to work and do what I love 
and not have to get fucking naked. Like, that's right, unless just, you want to. I mean, unless you, you I, can, unless can, I really you, you want to. You can get naked on, when you want to, which is really the best thing. That's exactly. the best thing about, about being in recovery. Like, the only thing you can't really do is get high. You exactly. know what I mean? Anything else you want to do, you can yeah. do, and it, there aren't so many limitations. Exactly. And I'm completely fine with that. I, I love what I do every day. I love getting up for work. I love just being a, not a normal human being, but a, like, a decent human being. No, I know what you mean. Like, I, I'm a productive member of society now. I'm not stealing money and drugging men in strip clubs anymore. Well, I commend you. Yes. You know, what, you, you, know, know what I mean? you know what I like to think? Like, when we started doing the podcast, I would talk about being in recovery, like, almost like a... Uh, like Harry Potter, right? Yeah. Like there's like this world of wizards that nobody knows about. Exactly. And like, and we like kind of are this underground secret society now. Yes. And we, we mm-hmm. wander around and we do what everybody else does, but we had this crazy life that was magical at some times, but sometimes of course. was like yeah. not, you know, and it led to total, you know, for you, total depraved misery, robbing, getting yeah. robbed, fucking jail. Me too. Just misery. It was my alter ego. Her. What was the stripper name? Envy. Oh my like god. Like envious, but envy for sure or for sure. She was definitely my alter ego. That's crazy. I think she. It was more insecurities for me. That um, what? Okay, so we were like high school and stuff. Like I was never really a girly girl, and whenever, <laughs> whenever. Hold on. Hold, hold on. on. <laughs> I'm bugging out. The band is going to be over and your son needs you. So what were you going to say, though? No, um, I was just going to say in high school, I wasn't really a girly girl. And whenever I found envy, I just felt like this sexual and you probably, like, beast right, that I was right. like, I can make a man do anything I want. Right, so. right. Taylor, <laughs> thank you so much for coming thank on. Thank you so much for having me. I that appreciate was cool. it. All right, right on. Good story. Crazy <laughs> yes. story. Go take care of the kid. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> So we're back in the Sentra. It turns out it's not a cilantro, right? It's a Nissan Sentra. And when we got here, we met this dude, Matt, who's one of the volunteers at the uh, Appalachian Healing Festival. Matt, how you doing? I'm pretty good. It, hold on. It just occurred to me what? that we're in the front of a Sentra. Yes. And your fucking gas light's on. So this totally feels like a fucking dope deal. Right, it does, right? The gaslight is now on, Ray. <laughs> Fuck, man, we can only go 44 miles. In the front of a center doing a podcast. That's Dude, awesome, I'm bro. wandering around. I love this shit, I love this. I'm one, and talk closer to the mic okay. or it's going to be all fucked up. I'm wandering around the festival selling dopey hats out of my backpack, and each thing I sell, it feels like I'm selling a bag, selling something. Like I, I, it's, It feels good. This, I have to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, This Se- has a familiar feel. It has a familiar feel. It does, I doesn't it? It, it does. It That's does. awesome. So when we got here, Matt, you're a volunteer at the festival. How'd you get roped into this thing? Yeah, uh, I met the, uh, you know, the guy, Charlie, that, that, does yeah. the, that organizes all of it through <laughs> actually another story. His wife, uh, my kid was staying with some people. Uh, my kid was staying at his friend's house and then went to the river swimming the next day and he got in some swift water, and Charlie and his wife was on that side of the river, and she jumped in and saved my kid, and they got his name, and we, you know, our last name is kind of, there's not like a lot of people with it. And They he, knew who you he, were. He figured out, and right. he, he knew of, we have a mutual friend, and he's like, hey, do you know this guy? And he's like, yeah, and he called me, and then I end up meeting him like that, and then I end up going to another couple other festivals that he does, and... And and he found out I was a fucking dope head. And, and here we are. Yeah, I'm a recovering, I'm a recovering drug addict, I guess. And, Very and, nice. And so they they do this thing for that, and and I'm really fond of Charlie and and what they do. And he I'm seems like an that, amazing but, guy. Yeah, he is. And and this whole event is uh, just it's outstanding. And it, it comes out of his brain, like he had an experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he he didn't want to come on the show. So sorry, Dopey Nation. Maybe I can coerce him later on. But he said he doesn't want to come on the show. But he told me this story about how uh, a friend of his. Um, had a kid and he and and she wanted his help to get the kid into rehab, and the kid wound up dying like right away, and it broke Charlie's heart. He was out fishing and he got the phone call mm. and he uh, he had the idea to set up this festival, and now it's gigantic, seven thousand people, yeah, yeah. all these major bands, and even you, Matt, are volunteering to help the cause. Yeah, yeah, it's it's what it's all about. It's about giving back. You know, I took away from so much, and, and now you know I want to give back as much as I can. And when we got here. 
Matt heard that we were collecting fucked up drug stories and he volunteered one. And when I asked him to tell it, he was like, nah, nah, I'm not going to tell it. I'm not going to tell it. But now here he is in the front of the center doing the dope deal. <laughs> I on totally dopey. got dope fiend into the front of the center. Excellent. So, sure. so let's hear the fucking story, man. Um, Okay, so I was actually staying at the motel, the, the Motel 6, you know, imagine that, like, right across the road from here. Uh, You're from around here? Yeah, I'm, I'm from around here, and uh, I was staying at the Motel 6 here across the, the way. It actually, it was, uh, my kid's mom was staying there, like, they were, she was staying there with, and, and you know, the kids were staying there, and I was just kind of there some and, and, and not there, and um, so, like, kind of the way it all started, I hadn't had to even, like, told you the way it all started, and, and so we're... She's staying there, and, and we don't really get along, and I come in there to see my kids some, and uh, they're, like, really trashy. It's a really trashy motel. Right. <laughs> but uh, I, I, there's a, there was a dope man staying there at the motel, too, you know. And, and you knew about and, it. And, and I knew that, you know, and uh, she had some Beats headphones, and I stole them from her and traded them to the dope man for, uh, like, three-tenths of fucking meth. Okay. You know, and... Uh, and these are like fucking two hundred dollar headphones, you know. I'm trading for three tenths of meth. I ain't care. So, so anyway, how much would three tenths of meth cost? The, about I think it's twenty bucks, ten, sixty bucks. Terrible deal. Yeah, ter- but you get, but deal, you get to get high, yeah. and it wasn't your headphones. And that's so fuck right, it. and that's how it works, man. It's all about what you need right then. What you know, I can I've, get. Yeah. yeah, I've done a lot worse, man. I've right, done a me too. Lot worse. I'm with you. So, uh, <clears throat> I just I never did enough meth to know how much I was buying. Like uh, a, yeah, and, and so I, I wasn't I wasn't a big meth guy either. Like I was more into like I like to not out and throw up on myself. Yeah, me too. Like I was really that. into that. That was, yeah. that was my thing. Like yeah. I loved it, you know. Um, but uh, so so I didn't want you know I didn't want my kids' mom to know I had any dope, you know. And I, I, I like stole her Beats headphones and I traded them for dope. And then uh, so I, I come across the road here to the fairgrounds, and you know it's dark, and I'm like, well, you know, sir, I can go over here and get fucking high, and, you know, and. So I'm over here, you know, and I done like stole a light bulb out of the motel room and I'm, and I'm you know, made me a little bulb <laughs> yeah. smoke. I'm over here fucking in the, uh. Wait, what's the bulb for? To smoke the meth in. So you're in a light bulb? Yeah. Tell yeah. me how that works. Uh, you gotta take the, uh, metal part you off screw, the You unscrew of, the socket of the thing? Yeah, you kinda, you kinda gotta use some pliers to kinda like get it started ripping now, This it is a real good story, like, all right. Like, okay, you just kinda peel off the metal part on, on the light bulb. Okay. And then, uh, you know, you got a hole in there uh-huh. and, and you just like. Usually what I would do, I would take salt, put like salt in it. I would, you know, have a salt shaker, put salt in it and shake the salt around real good. And that takes all the white shit off the inside of the light bulb. Okay. You know? Because what would, what would happen if you didn't take the white shit off? I don't know. All right. So I really don't know. So it just you, seemed like it's something and okay. everybody that I knew, like, that's what I that's what you do. do. Yeah, that's what they do. So, so it's like cleaning the white shit off, the frosting off yeah, the bulb. Yeah, off the bulb. And then and you then, drop the meth in there and you just burn yeah, the Yeah, usually what I would do is like rinse it out with some water real good after I did that, after, you know, ran the salt through it. And then I would take a take a fucking paper towel and stick down in it and dry it off. You got to be really careful. You know, light bulbs are real fragile. Very so you're like fragile. being very careful and you're like, at the same time, you're super excited because you're about to fucking do some dub. You yes, know how sir. it is, you know? Yes. So, um, so, you know, I do, I do all that and I'm like, have to be like sneaky as fuck doing that in the motel room and then I'm like sneaking across the, across the road with this light bulb. So you cleaned out the shit and you clean out your yeah, bulb? Yeah, I do that in the bathroom. Okay. You know what I'm saying? In the wife's or in the... In, in my... In, in the daughter? In, 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 in the, the motel. Okay. Where my kid's mom was. Yes. Like, we wasn't married at the time. Right. We got married later on and it didn't work out. Yeah, it yeah. But anyways, uh, so, so then I'm like, well, you know, like I need to do this like... You know, I obviously can't sit in the bathroom smoking fucking meth. You know, she's going to know, and I don't want her to know. And the main reason I don't want her to know is not because I don't want to know her. her you don't want to share it with her? I don't want to fucking share my shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, God, I only got three tenths, you know, whatever. Right, well, yeah. So so I come across the road. I'm like, well, certainly there's somewhere where I can just go there and, like, yeah, I can just go here and fucking smoke the mess. So, so there's this fucking pavilion there, and it's like full of hay. And, well, it's, and it's the it's the it's. I'm looking at it right now. It says the AG Pavilion. The Ag Pavilion. And, and I yeah. assume that Ag is for agriculture. Yeah. So we're at a state fairground. This is serious West Virginian shit. Because lots it's of people are listening. State Fair, they're yeah. listening all over the world. So I'm just trying to explain this. It's an. It's like a. What's a pavilion? What's, it's like a warehouse where they store. They have livestock in there. Okay. Yeah, so when you yeah. were getting high, were there? Were yeah, there? but there wasn't none in there at the time. This okay. was like. This is like earlier in the year before the fair's here but they got a bunch of hay in there right so it's probably the most terrible place ever to go and smoke any fucking thing right you especially a, a light bulb especially yeah you got a light bulb with a fucking straw in your mouth and just oh my god just being a fucking idiot um so anyways i'm in there and i'm and uh you know i, I go in the ag pavilion and then uh i'm in there smoking and and then i think that so so i'm getting high and, and, and i don't know how much time 
is going by, and, and I'm just sitting there, and, you know, I'm fucking having a good old time, probably watching porn on my fucking phone. And, right. And, and I think that I hear people, and, and, and I still, like, halfway believe that there was some people there. I, I'm not sure, like, that maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. You never was know. We'll never know. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, like, barricade myself in with, like, some, some hay, like, some smaller hay bales, and, like, barricade myself in, and I'm just in there, like, peeking out the corners of the hay and, and like, hearing you like, oh, God, I got to you know, and, I'm, and at the same time, I'm like clicking a light or hitting this bulb, you know, and, and smoking the fuck out of cigarettes. And so then I decide I was and like. And you're just around the most flammable material. Oh, that there yeah, is. yeah, okay. yeah. And so then I decide I'm going to fucking, you know, I'm like, well, well I got to get out of here, you know. And uh, <laughs> by this time, it's almost fucking like four or five o'clock in the morning. And so I, I, I get out of it and I go back over to the motel room when I go in. And, and so my kid's mom, she's like. You you fucking you stink. She's like you smell like like mulch or something, you know. And and like my pants are burned. Like I had these like jogging pants on. I had this big burn on them. I didn't even know. Right. And um, I, she was like, "What was you doing?" I was like, "I I was just walking around at the fairgrounds, you know. I'm just pissed off, you know, just whatever." And I'm like trying to hide, like I'm high in my eyes. Trying are, to sh- say you're angry so she doesn't talk to yeah, you. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Classic. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like my eyes are probably popping out of my fucking head, and uh, I. I don't know. So like, I just try to like chill out and I'm like, hold up in the motel room. Like she, she's gone. Her and the kids leaving. Like, I just kind of like, you know, stay there and just like hold up in the motel room. Like I don't want like nobody to even know that I'm there, you know? And then, uh, so like several hours go by and, uh, she comes back and there's fucking like, she's like, she comes in, there's like fire trucks and shit out, like out, like outside. And there's like, I noticed there's like a lot of smoke. She comes in and you can smell smoke and shit. And, uh, I was like, you know, what's going on? She's like, there's a bunch of fire trucks and shit out there and, and something's on fire. And I look out the window and the fucking ag pavilion's like smoking and like, it's bad. And like, there's all kinds of fire trucks. Like the whole fairgrounds looks like it's full of fucking smoke. And the, the motel parking lot, like every, there's all kinds of people like out there speculating this shit. And I'm like, Oh my God. And then she's like, she's like, what'd you do? What'd you do? And I Did was, you tell her? <laughs> no, I, no. I was just like, well, I was just smoking cigarettes, you know? And like, I just didn't want her. Like, but she maybe, but maybe it. that sound you heard was another crackhead who was smoking crack in maybe the act pavilion. And that dude burned the place. That makes me fucking feel better. Maybe it wasn't you sure. at all. Matt. It might've not been, but it was, uh, that's it was one of those things. So I was like scared to death, man. And then like I'm high on mess still. So I'm like like paranoid as fuck. And I'm like, oh my God, they're going to come arrest me for arson. It's a federal fucking offense. Plus it's the fairgrounds. And it was just, you know. But so now I look back at it and I think, God, what a fucking idiot I was. What you know? That is the most West Virginia dopey story that I can imagine for the day. So thank you. You were worried about this. But so I appreciate that. Uh, now, what I want to know is what was the thing that brought you into recovery? Man, my kids, uh, mostly, so I have three kids right now. They're 9, 10, and 11. The 11-year-old's the boy, and he's almost 12. Right. Um, so at this time, this is two years ago, so he's like nine. Right. And, uh, yeah, I have a nine-year-old and I have a one-year-old now. Yeah, and, and it's like, so, so the boy, he was nine at the time, and he can he could he was aware of the most and 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 so like i'm not sitting around smoking meth in front of him or shooting dope in front of him but he knew something was wrong with me you know just by my attitude i'm like super depressed all the time i'm just sad fucking i'm just i'm not fucking normal you know and he he understands that he picked up on yeah me and him's always been close like i'm i'm like i've always like played with him a lot we play ball we right you know we do things together we go out in the woods together you know we just we've always been close and you know he can tell like, like at my bottom, he knew something was wrong. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and, and the girls may have been a little bit aware, but, you know, not, not like he was. You know, they were, they were a little younger. But uh, it's like, man, every time I would leave and, and I'd be like, you know, I'm going somewhere. It's like he was, like he had his look on his face. Like he was just worried. He was like, be like where, where are you going, daddy? And right. it was almost, dude, it's like a lot of those times, it's like he had tears in his eyes. Like he was like scared to death that he was never going to see me again. Like, and he might he, not. Like, yeah. You know, like something was going to happen to me. And like, like me and this kid is like, and, and like right today, like we're, we're really, really close, you know, now, but even then when I was using, we was close. Like I seen him a lot. It's not like I just ever left and was gone away for a long time. It's I know like, what you mean. You know, I, I was, I was there physically, but, but a lot of times mentally I wasn't. And, and so that, that look on his face and I remember like leaving and be, being out copping dope or doing whatever I was doing, hustling dope and things. And, uh, 
and just thinking like, man, you got a fucking eight year old, nine year old at home. And he's worried to death about his dad. He's and you wondered, could see you know, how fucked you were yeah, in dude. his eyes. Yeah, and you I would, look, right, you looked at yeah. him and you saw yourself. And I would think like, like you know what? Like he's 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 nine years old. He don't need to be worried about his dad. He needs to be being a nine year old, having fun and yeah, enjoying. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Life. He needs yeah. to be able. And it wasn't like he could even do that. Like it, like he couldn't even like play like a normal kid because he's like so wrapped up in like worry, like like oh, like I'm gonna lose my dad. Like and no kid, no yeah. kid needs that. Yeah, shit. Yeah, and then just like yeah, the kids they they don't they don't deserve that shit. And I was just like, man, I I need help. And there was a lot of days like I would wake up and I just hated waking up. I hated myself and I and I didn't want to wake up no more. But like those kids kept me hanging on. Like no motherfucker, you can't just die. Like you you know like. You, you well, you could, something. but you did. Well, the, I could have. Did yeah, you go to treatment or anything? I went to a 28 day rehab program, and I Around got here? out. Uh, it was actually it was in Mingo County. It was like four and a half hours away. All right, yeah, Logan County, Mingo County, right, right in that area. And uh, so it uh, 28 days, man. I came back, and uh, was that it, the first time you went to treatment? I went to treatment actually, dude, when I was 17 for smoking pot. Right. Yeah. And so it was you were a ready. Joke to you me. weren't ready when you were yeah, 17. You were no, like, what, fuck, no, what dude. the fuck? My life yeah. isn't like this. I went then. I was on probation as a juvenile for um selling pot in school right and uh you know so then i go you know i'm going to rehab then and it was like it was kind of cool right you know what i mean and, and you're like, well Whoa. you weren't fucking totally demoralized no. and fucked yeah no you were a all. weed dealer in 17 it's yeah, a whole at other that thing point, i'm interesting yeah. as a fucking 17 yeah. year old right. so so i had went to rehab for smoking pot and and it was only the only reason i went was to keep myself from going to a juvenile detention center but of course like Four months after the rehab, after I got back from the rehab, I ended up getting going to a detention center anyways. Uh, right. But, you know, because because you were fucked. Going. Yeah, because yeah, exactly. I kept doing the same shit I was doing. But um, at this point, like, um, I, had been, I had been indicted a couple times, and I'd done a pretrial diversion program called Drug Court. Yeah, you know? I've been hearing a lot yeah. about Drug Court. Yeah, so yeah. I graduated Drug Court and, uh, <clears throat> and got, the, uh, got the charges dismissed, right? So they dismissed your charges. Well, then, so then at this point, like, when that, that had happened, like, with me, like, catching the fairgrounds on fire or whatever, I, uh, they, I was just at a bottom, man, and there was no legal charges over my head, and I fucking You just knew you better, were fucking man. done. Yeah, and I, like, just begged to get into rehab, like, begged and begged, and, and so finally a place took me, and, uh, and I, and, I, and so when I finished, I just, like, didn't know what to do, and, uh, I found a program, you know, and, uh. That's what I fucking did, dude. I went like dived head first, and you know, and I got a sponsor, and, and you, know, you did the that thing. shit, dude. And I, and that's that's what I do. And so then, like, like me volunteering here today, like service work's a big part of my recovery. I love doing that. I love giving back. Like I said, it's the least I can do. I like done stupid shit all the time. Stole shit, caught their fucking fairgrounds on fire. You know, shit like that. And so that the reason I didn't want to share, that, I was afraid of being incriminated. You no, know I, dude, saying? I understand. But, uh, but we're not going to use your last name, and you're here doing the right fucking thing. Yeah. And it's a great story. And, uh, and obviously, like, I feel what you're saying. And, like, you know, I did the same thing happened to me with my kid. You know, that's what, that's what put me on the right path. And, and it's not like I did it for my kid. I did it because I couldn't be that person. Yeah, that's, that's what it that been was, like. I could not accept that no, I would, yeah. that's who I was going to be. It wasn't for my, yeah. my daughter. And I'm really close with my daughter. It was because I couldn't be that person. Like, yeah. it just, it was too much. And uh, it's great to meet you. Great yeah, to have well, you on the show. Mm-hmm. And uh, cool, man. Thanks, man. Hey, man. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, no doubt. It's been real, bro. Cool, man. All right. So it is now the day after the Healing Appalachia Festival. We're outside of West Virginia. We're in Covington, Virginia. Here's the backstory. Yesterday, Ray and I took a bunch of cool addicts uh, in recovery into the Nissan Sentra and did interviews. The third one, Matt, a.k.a. Flip, Somehow it didn't get recorded. So Matt invited us to meet him this morning at his hotel and uh, to re-record. Welcome back. Hey, glad to be here. And Matt, s- too. Matt spoke at the Healing Appalachia concert last night. Was that, what was that like? Uh, it was weird. Talk- I mean, it, it, was, it was very cool. Um, it was an amazing opportunity to share my story with a lot more people than I'm used to. Um, but I'm used to sharing at meetings and at work with people that I know are on my level. Yeah. Um, so it was just different, but it was, it was very cool. Did it like, I mean, like I was on stage a bunch yesterday and it like, I kind of got high on it, kind of freaked me out. I was kind of totally like 
in myself, sure. you know, because it was like what I said, and I kept thinking, was it good? Was it this? What, did you have any of those kinds of feelings, or were you better about not thinking about it? A little bit, man, because you know, you, I don't want to go up there and just, um, just bomb or anything. You right, know? right, right, right. But at the same time, I know, you know, one thing my sponsor always tells me, you can think of a thousand different things to say and then forget them all in front of people. So maybe if you forget, you say exactly what they needed to hear, right? Well, that's a nice way to look at it. Uh, that's that's hey, the way yeah. I have to. That's yeah. a good way to look at it. <laughs> so the funny thing to me is how, like, together you seem to me and, like, some of the stuff you told me Yesterday And like don't you find that to be like I find that to be the craziest thing about recovery Like we are these messes Like totally out there shit And then all of a sudden We have our shit together And you have a baby And you're speaking in front of these people About your recovery And you work in treatment Like don't you find that to be The weird anachronistic element of recovery It is really weird It's it cool is, though It is It's great it's, it's, it's amazing how people can make 180s When they, when they work on themselves and, and do the right thing You know so let's hear one of the worst things you've ever done. Kick, hit him with the dopey, as Chris loved to say. Okay. Um, well, I, so yesterday we were talking about the... Uh, Unless another story popped in your head since then. Uh, well, um, the worst thing I've ever done, man, it'd be hard to, to narrow that down. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Um, so we were talking about the methadone thing yesterday. Um, I was in a... Uh, I, I live in Roanoke, Virginia, and they have an extremely crooked, or did have an extremely crooked methadone clinic. Um, the prescribing doctor also had a private practice where he prescribed a lot of the uh, methadone participant Sanex, right? Right. So um, my daily... That's crazy, by the way. It is. It I is. mean, I would always buy Xanax or Clonopins, right. like either right before or right after I'd get methadone, because it was a great feeling. It sure. Was, it was sure. very tranquil, we'll say. It was. It was it, like it, debilitatingly it, tranquil. It, yeah, it's a, it's a one-two punch. You yeah. Know? Um, so the doctor's actually providing it. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Um, so my daily routine would generally consist of taking the Xanax, going and taking my dose, which they bumped me up to 180 in about uh, about 60 days. That's just um, insane. How did they explain yeah. that? Uh, they really didn't. I mean, all you had to do was just go in and say, yeah, I don't feel it. And they would, they'd give you 10 more milligrams. Um, and 180 is arguably like way too much. D- dangerously. I was on much. 150 yeah. for years yeah. and like it was too much. Right. And I was just like, I couldn't do anything. I've heard of people being on more, but, but for me. 180 um, is a lot. Right. And for me, it had me higher than the heroin was a lot really? of times. Yeah. Yeah. Spe- well, especially with the Xanax. But I don't know if you ever, when you listen to the show, if you heard about my friend Todd, who was like crazy fish guy, dead guy, like he wound up dying last summer. Oh. His, Oh, wow. And um, he, he was on the clinic now and again, but when he would drink my methadone, he would get so much higher than when he did dope. And right. he would always just laugh his ass off about how the methadone... It just yeah, makes yeah. me think of it. Well, I'm a crazy fish guy, too, so I can relate to that. Yeah. So, um, so several times this happened to me. I think three times. I, you know, my routine was take the Xanax, take the dose, go home, take a bong hit, light a cigarette and I would like put on a movie and just like kick it in bed right like what's a classic um, movie you'd watch in those times uh, at those times I think uh, like Ocean Eleven had just came out and, okay uh, or Ocean's Eleven um, remember I had Charlie Bartlett um, which is a Kind of a dopey movie. He's selling prescriptions at a, a, I don't at a think, high school. I don't think I've seen that one. It's, an inter- there's, it's that Russian kid who recently passed away that's in it. I can't remember his name right now. but anyway. Charlie Bartlett's a good dopey movie. It's an interesting movie. Yeah, Ocean's yeah. Eleven I watched a lot kicking and using. Right. Because I was always on TV. I always watched Train Spotting, yeah. Um, yeah. which I've relapsed over before, but that's a different story. Yes, um, I can imagine. So several times I woke up on fire. So you're at home. You're fucking, you took a bong hit, you took your Xanax and your methadone, and you lit yourself on fire. I, I lit a cigarette and did the, uh, the chin-to-chest rest and woke up um, with the blanket burnt and smoldering around me. Um, one time, it burnt my T-shirt off, and the screen print on the shirt had actually burnt into my chest oh like, my a, God. like a tattoo, you know? Um, it took a couple days to... To peel and wash off, but that happened three times. And you know what? Um, what 
I think separates the addict from whatever a normal person is, is, you know, most people would say, man, I should probably stop eating the Xanax or man, I should probably lower my dose. My solution was, you know, the responsible thing to do here is to start smoking crack. I knew that. Really, and, I, was, and, I was expecting right, math. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. And, and so instead of the bong hit, I would just melt down a boulder every day after, um, after the methadone clinic, and hey, I mean, it worked. I didn't set myself on fire again, but uh, that makes that reminds me so much of uh, because you forget about it. Like, I mean, you know, they, they talk about built in forgetter or whatever, like yeah, the insanity, yeah. whatever the built in forgetter is. I never quite grasp it, but all of my clothes were burnt up, like, yeah. all of my pants had had cigarette burns, oh, like the, four cigarette burns here, the all of my shirts had four cigarette burns here. And like all my clothes were just burnt up. Yeah. I remember I went to rehab. I had my blanket was burnt to a crisp and they made me carry it around because they didn't know I had it. Right, like I had a right. bedspread over the blanket and one day they came in and they saw it and they made me carry it around all day. Oh, wow. These bastards. Yeah. Um, but it's funny how much we burn and live with. Oh, absolutely. I think I still have a couple of hoodies that have the... The burns. The nod burns on it. There's and- something incredibly... Uh, I want to say reassuring about seeing the damage I would do in my head. I don't know why there was a comfort. I remember I was in Austin, Texas, and uh, I was sick. Uh, I went to Austin, Texas for work, and I was sick. And uh, and I, I went to my boss, and I borrowed 100 bucks, and I went out to score. And I'd never been to Austin, Texas. Right. And I meet this street kid, you know what I mean? And he's wearing this hoodie with this uh, Japanese fucking manga whatever it's called <laughs> image on it and uh, and I'm walk I'm wandering around town with him for you know 5 hours and I'm sick as shit until he tell and he's trying to score for me whatever until he's like this is a dumb story he he says to me give me the 100 bucks the cab driver has it and then he takes off the hoodie and he gives me the hoodie he gets in the cab and drives away. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, and I kept that hoodie was like the badge of like shame mm-hmm. and honor and like whatever. But by the time I lost that hoodie, it was burnt to a fucking crisp. Yeah. You know? That's how it goes. Tell um, but, so, yeah, That reminds me of a time I, I was living in Nashville, Tennessee for a while. And um, I remember I, I at Nashville, by the way, used to be the land of cartel black tar. Okay. Um, and I just uh, done a banger and was driving down the interstate with like um, basketball shorts on, right? Yeah. And I light a cigarette and it's in my right hand. And, you know, usually when you're driving, you got it in your left out the window. But uh, I guess I just nodded out driving and I burnt through the shorts and burnt my leg. And that's what woke me up as I'm like veering towards the median. Um, Crazy. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah you can of- relate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny, though. I mean, I think that's something that uh, one of my favorite things about Dopey is to, like, have a conversation like this, be brought back to this thing, and then know that it's done. You know yeah. what I mean? I have no longing to get robbed by some idiot in Austin and burn myself. God, Like, man. that's not right. a longing that I have. Right. But it's still like, you know, I was talking to Critter. It's like we did really fucked up stupid shit. But we live to tell the tale, and, it, and and our life wasn't in a mall all day. Right. You know, we, I mean, like, I, and like somebody, you know, a friend of mine is like, we're, you're glamorizing drugs. And I don't know if you are. It was just our experience. You know what sure. I mean? Is sure. it glamorizing? What do you think? I don't believe so, man. I, I think that um, these stories help me remind myself of where I don't want to go back to. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, the past doesn't define us we are who we are now and who we're going to grow to be you know um but i don't see them as war stories and i also tend to uh tend to play the tape through also as it were you know right Um, like i tell i could tell a thousand different fun lsd stories but i can also tell you the kicker about where i went to prison for for distributing it to the public and you know it's it's not all fun you know um Behind every what someone would call a war story is another one where um, 
You're a you know, casualty of the fucking war. Absolutely. There's there's death and destruction in my wake, you know. And, and misery uh, in your life. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like if it was fun the whole way through, we'd still be doing oh, it. Oh, absolutely. If it was absolutely. doable, if it was a sustainable thing, sure. I would have loved to sustain it. But it, it all it sustained was misery and deprivation yeah, and, and hurting everybody, yeah. you know, pain. And I think we talked about this yesterday. You know, it's... Um, we got we got stuck in this thing where we knew what we were doing to ourselves, but we couldn't stop. And you know, like people say, uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. But I knew that, like, that heroin is not a part of your balanced breakfast. It, yeah, it's yeah. not chock full of vitamin C. It's not. Uh, it it doesn't sustain life. Yet we could not stop doing these things to ourselves. Well, I mean, it's it was a very seductive thing. Sure. And then once I had it. I thought I needed it to enjoy life. Oh, like, yeah. that's what I thought. Oh, yeah. I thought I needed to be high to enjoy life. And I didn't. And I figured suckers got sober and that they lied about enjoying oh, it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. the fact that I got sober and I really like my life, it, it almost sounds like I'm lying. Yeah. Like, when I say yeah. it, you know, it's for like, sure. but, it, but it's the truth. Well, and that's, that's such a hard barrier for a lot of people to get clean is, you know, what am I going to do now? Who am, am I going to be? Right. And it, this is how I've had fun for, uh, you know, in my case, most of my life I used for 23 years. So what am I going to do? But for me, it's, it's, it's people, and I can enjoy some of those same, same things. Like I told you, you know, me and my, my buddy Dave and Cliff, who you met yesterday, go to shows all the time. I have people like like critter and matt in my life that are just amazing people and they they keep me going man you know that's that's my family and i I love those guys and um that's uh you know people have filled the drug void for me me know? too no that's great i mean i i've heard a bunch of people say how uh connection is the opposite of addiction absolutely and like that's yeah. a cool I, I don't i don't like saying any of these things but when but they resonate you know what i mean right. it's the truth you know it, it's yeah. like it's amazing do you want to tell tell one of the stories that you didn't tell yesterday to close it up that i didn't tell no 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 yesterday. i'm sorry that you told yesterday okay. that you didn't okay. tell okay. yesterday gotcha. whichever you'd prefer the dmt um, or the acid or whatever well, okay, so um, you know, I told and I, I can summarize the acid stories. My my nickname Flip came from me eating a tin strip and uh, trying to ride a Ford Ranger like a surfboard and flying off of it, doing somersaults and and landing and just running away. Well, you did um, you land it? Um, I didn't stick the landing. Okay. I did a tuck and roll sort of situation and just popped up. But you know, we talked about DMT yesterday. Have you ever heard of DET? No, but I'm sure Chris would have known. Yeah, it's diethyltryptamine, and it, it lasts for like two to four hours. Okay, I forgot about that one. But so we yesterday we were talking about my last DMT experience. I had many great experiences with DMT, but this last one, um, my friend Paige and I had a gram that had just been made, and we had like a very small, probably less than quarter gram chunk of bud that we were like pouring this DMT on. And we were just smoking it all night like assholes, you know, just uh, continuously bla blasting off. So the last hit I took probably had a half gram stuck to it, and it, it pulled through the bowl. And um, I blasted off to some really scary uh, places. And the last thing I remember before I woke up, I am, um, like, on an autopsy table, and there is these like fluid moving like i don't space clowns with like this black and white face makeup these big gnarly like green teeth and terrifying ter terrifying absolutely yes. terrifying yes. i've been you know i've 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 gone pro with hallucinogens and i've never it's like uh, the other side of like the paisley and the dancing bears sure. and the good times sure it's like the yeah. opposite yeah like the room is breathing well this room is doing some more shit maniacal <laughs> laughter you know yeah, it, right. it, that's what it was man and um so they were poking the scalpel or knife at me um and it had teeth and freaking claws and hair and it was moving and, and it was terrifying man so after i woke up from that i decided that dmt would probably have to go on the shelf for a while and that know? was the last time you did it it was yeah yeah and um and the thing that brought you into recovery you said was the arrest uh so i've been arrested many times when i got clean i had 17 years in prison over my head um the last time i got in trouble 
I overdosed on fentanyl and um, clonopin. Yeah. And I wrecked my car, got a DUI. Um, I was homeless, um, walking around. But, you know, what finally got me clean was um, my parents kind of tricking me into going to treatment. And um, What was the trick? Uh, so... My mother had picked me up from, uh, she knew I was homeless. She knew I probably needed a shower and, and food and all that. So she took me to her house and I got cleaned up and, of course, manipulated her into uh, giving me a ride to the trap for a bag. And, right. Um, you know, I used this needle that was like a freaking lightning bolt and, you know, it was rusty and barely, f- anyway, it was, it was terrible. It's, the way you try to hit with something like that and, like, the, every time you would hit with something like that, you were like, thank God. Oh, but yeah. how about when you couldn't? I, I remember one of the last times, I mean, it was before I relapsed badly, but I remember one of the last times I had a needle and I, I had gotten clean and I had like gotten five days or something and I was like, fuck this. And I went and I scored and I was in LA so you couldn't buy needles in the pharmacy. Right. So I just had an old needle and I'm like, I'm like putting it together and I'm putting it together and it will not hit. It won't, you know, it's clogged. I can't burn it out. I can't do anything. Yeah. So I wound up breaking the fucking shit off and like shooting it up my nose. Oh man. Which was, it, worked. Well, it was effective. Yeah. Bold move, but yeah. But, yeah. but like, anyway, so you, but this needle actually hit. It, finally it did, man. I was in the, in the floor of a Walmart bathroom with blood all around me. It was, it was pretty bad, you know? Um, so the next day, my, my mother took me to my father's house, and um, they had kind of gotten together to ruse me um, down to his place, and he already had kind of like a treatment line set up. And he gave me a choice between a TDO or going to a rehab, um, TDO being a temporary detainment order where they take you to a mental health facility. Um, at that time, I was doing a lot of meth, and um, it, I was just not in a good place. So you were I, super sick. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I agreed to go to treatment, man. And as soon as I got in the car, I just slumped down in the seat and uh, tears streamed down my face. And I, I just knew that, um, you know, it might not be over forever, but it was over then, you know. I um, totally know what you mean. And I, I kind of deserved, uh, I realized that I deserved better of myself and that the people that love me deserve better of me. So, Can I ask you a stupid question? Of course. Okay. It's like when you say, you know, it's not necessarily over forever, mm-hmm. right? And I, and I feel the same way. Like I have yeah. a fantasy about getting stoned when I'm an old man or right. whatever, the, or being high on whatever I want to be on when I, one day, you know? Right. And it's like, it's not something I pine for. It's just a sort of like fantasy. It's, I wouldn't even call it a reservation. It's like, sure. you know, how do you deal with the idea that it's not forever? Like, what does it really mean to you? Um, I think uh, just kind of the concept that I have to be clean for the rest of my life is a bit too much for me. Is it too um, much for you or do you know that if you tell yourself that you'll, you get scared of like the consequences of, of even saying it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, anything can happen. I don't know what tomorrow brings. All I'm promised is today. So I will st- do what I can to stay clean just for today. Because that works. It does. Right? All right. It really does work. And I'll, I'll try that again tomorrow, you know? Exactly. And, I got you, uh, for, for Right now, it's worked for, you know, over two years. So well, we'll that's keep, amazing. Keep on trucking. I understand what you're saying. Thank you so much for coming on. Sorry we had to rechase you back hey, for this thing. No, no, no. I think worries. it was great, though. It was. It so was. thank you very much. My pleasure, man. All right, man. Cool, man. So what's up? Dopey Nation, we're back again. Hey, Dave. Hey, Ray. So this is the first ever DC live dopey on the road show on the road again. What would you, how would you, what would you rate it? What would you describe it as this experience as a, a co-host traveling five companion, out of five stars and uh, Ray actually, we left the festival. We're driving up the highway and I'm, I'm, uh, the Yiddish word for this experience is kvelling. I'm kvelling. You know that word? Yes. I'm kvelling about how amazing... I'm from New York, Dave. I, you're I, from Florida, I, I right? I speak Yiddish. Listen, listen, right. You're from Florida. <laughs> that's Florida's the home of Yiddish. <laughs> well, that's true. But I've never heard you... Not in northern Florida. Um, and I've never heard you kvelling. But we were kvelling together about how great the festival was. Yes. And Ray turns to me and he says, I think it was historic. 
It was historic. Why do you think it was historic? That has never happened before. Where uh, Do you know that? No, but I would guess there's never been a big festival where there's a bunch of country and rock bands, and in between they had AA qualifications that were... They weren't technically AA well, qualifications, because there was a girl, remember, there was a girl oh, she there. she spoke about her parents had died. You know, she came up to me to buy a dopey hat. Yeah. She was like, I want to get a dopey hat. And I think she wanted me to give her a hat for free because her parents died. Maybe. And I didn't. I said, they're 20 bucks, and she never came back. Well, well Do you think but, I'm heartless for well, that? The other hats were selling for 15 so 20 was high. I know, but the other hats were cheapo hats. Oh, okay. The other hats were uh, trucker it, hats. But no, I don't think there's ever been a festival where between, these, between the acts, the, there was qualification-type stories with a huge crowd Taking it very seriously and listening, but they were fucked up. They were some of them were fucked up. Before we say another word, I just want to say we had an amazing time at the Healing Appalachia Festival. It was great. If anybody is listening from the Healing Appalachia place, uh, Quincy's definitely listening. So thank you, Quincy, and thank you, Healing Appalachia people. They really, I mean, for a bunch of rednecks in West Virginia, they Whoa. really they really made me feel at home. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Twenty twenty. What does that mean, Appalachia? Healing Appalachia 2020. What is it? Oh, yeah. Next year, they, they actually invited me back. Mm-hmm. And um, it was my first, pro- well, pseudo professional emceeing job. And I think it was a success. Mm-hmm. What would you, how would you rate my performance? I think your learning curve was very high. What does that mean? You that keep saying that, from, but I'm really from, not sure what from it means. Totally amateur, not knowing what you're doing, to totally pro at the end, knowing what you're doing in one day. Yeah, I started out a little disheveled and I ended really, really good. Yeah, but in your first one, didn't you, was that when you said I've doubled the Jewish population of West Virginia? Yeah, that was my that go-to. Was, that was great. I missed the one where you said how many Jews in the audience. Yeah, I, I counted three Jews and three fake Jews. And now I know the dopey nation is dying for a taste of, uh, of me emceeing the Appalachian <laughs> Healing Festival. So here is a little taste of uh, me emceeing the Appalachian Healing Festival. Fucking dead, so give your, let's give this guy a round of applause. Right. Oh, this is true. Uh, my name is Dave. Uh, I'm a drug addict in recovery. Hey guys, how you doing? Cool. There you go. I do a podcast. It's called Dopey. It's on drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. Check it out if you want. It's good. I've been in recovery for four years. I was a heroin addict, and I've never played a harmonica in front of 7,000 people. So I'm going to do it. What the fuck, right? And then we have a speaker, and then you guys get Tyler. But first, I'm going to play harmonica. I'm in West Virginia. Why not, right? You guys in the back, can you hear me okay? They don't hear anything. So there it is, huh? What do you think about that? That was pretty great. I need you to explain to the Dopey Nation my osteopathy bit. Uh, so Dave, at one point, was supposed to announce that there's an osteopathic acupuncturist in a tent on the edge. <laughs> and Dave announced it by saying, there's an osteopathic acupuncturist 
I don't think it works, but whatever, or something like that. Uh, I've been to rehab, and they did fucking osteopathy shit on me and the acupuncture on me, and it didn't work. Have you ever had it done? No. It just didn't work. So what are you going to do? You know, I... I, I I cannot be dishonest uh, to a bunch of addicts, but they weren't even addicts. No. I said, who's sober? And, like, nobody cheered. I said, who wants to be sober? Less people cheered. So, they were, they were, they were, you know, it was an amazing experience. But the doctor didn't like it. Oh, yeah. So then the, the head of osteopathy showed up, and she had to get on stage and tell the audience what how osteopathy and acupuncture actually work. So that was a little bit. But if, if I didn't know Dave and I was in the audience, I would think that is so fucking cool. That guy announced it and said it doesn't work. But since I did know Dave, I was like, oh, my God. Dave fucked up. <laughs> um, so we are in Washington, D.C. We're sitting between the Washington Monument, the Capitol Building, the White House, the Smithsonian, and something over there. We actually got into D.C., and we went to this insanely good barbecue spot called... Uh, backyard. Backyard Smoke Spot, which sounds like a place I used to get high in, the Backyard it was Smoke so Spot. Good. So, dude, do your little Yelp review, a little dopey foodie for the, for Yelp, the people. Well, we've had two... So we have two amazing meals on this trip... Now, and uh, we were driving here, and Ga- Dave Googled uh, best, best barbecue in D.C. The best barbecue in D.C. was the Federalist Pig, and Ray's very political, so I wanted to take him there. <laughs> but uh, the sides were so they lackluster. Didn't, they didn't have much vegetarian sides, and this one, he read it out, and like they had hush puppies, mac and cheese, everything. Greens, Greens. everything. And it was so good. And we sat in a picnic table out front, or we covered in flies. Yeah, we were covered in flies, but I ate, like, the most delicious ribs with really delicious spicy barbecue sauce, and then we, we shared the beans and the hush puppies. I tasted Ray's mac and cheese. It was delightfully rich and, and decadent. And uh, if you guys are in D.C. and you don't mind not eating in a fancy place and you want to pick up your, your barbecue to go, I really recommend yeah, the, it's a takeout place. the backyard smoke spot. And if you want to get high, go to your backyard smoke spot and get high. I'm just kidding. And that's a joke. Don't get high. Um, what are you looking for? You ready for the email? I don't know. Dopey email, everybody. No, we're not ready. Okay, okay. dopey email. Here we go. This is a dopey email from a, a great Dopey Nation contributor. He calls himself Johnny Socket, which is a great dopey nickname. I, we, we learned a lot of dopey nicknames this weekend. There was Critter, Critter Flip. Fucking, there were some other ones, I think. Try, you know, there was a bunch of like weird. Uh, I mean, I think in West Virginia, like as Sk- a, skin, skin and critter were the same yeah. person. Um, and I thought that was really cool. I thought a slice of addicts from West Virginia on dopey is something different. Uh, a little Appalachian dope fiend shit is something different, right? Yep, it's not your typical. New York City uh, banter, but not like all the emails are from New York City or the voicemail. But anyway, this is an vo- uh, email from Johnny Socket. I'm going to read it. It says, uh, Dear Dave, I'm writing this dopey story that I already sent in a voicemail. I don't know how I didn't hear the voicemail. I'm going to say this right now. If I haven't responded, if I have, oh, before I even say that, last episode, I made a colossal faux pas and I played Evan's LSD tripping story twice. So I want to apologize to the Dopey Nation. And I want to say I didn't do it on purpose. I didn't rerun Evan's story. It's totally a mistake. So if you heard it and you were wondering if I'm running out of stories, Ray, are you going to say something? I accept your apology. I appreciate that. Um, Seriously, I apologize. I don't like doing stuff like that. If I have your voicemail, fucking remind me. If if I have your hat or your stickers or anything that I said I was going to do and haven't done... I need constant reminders. I'm incredibly forgetful and disorganized. And I have a lot of things going on at once. And, so I, con- and constant love and praise. I need those things too? Yes, yes. I need constant, yes. I need constant. And reassurance. Can you give me that right now? Uh, you're doing great, Dave. Can you, I don't hear any love, love there. You. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I need constant. No, I just need reminders so you can tell me what you need. That's important. And living in a, an addict's mind that craves constant reassurance, love, reminders is not an easy thing to do. So just bear with me because I'm doing my best. I don't know why you need to be so critical of me, Ray. 
I wasn't being critical. Well, I, it seemed when you're reminding me that I need constant reassurance. We feel, talked about well, this. It either, we just it, talked about it, this. Exactly, but I don't, I don't think the Dopey Nation needs to hear all of my faux pas and foibles, right? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to read the email now. Okay. Okay. Dear Dave, I'm writing this dopey story. This dopey, dopey podcast. podcast. You just saying it? It's coming in your ear. We sang it already. Yeah, I, that, yeah in the beginning. I love that song. Anyway. I'm writing this dopey story that I already sent in a voicemail, but I feel I didn't do the story any justice when recording it because I became quite nervous when speaking out loud. But anyways, here it is. I was probably 20 or 21, somewhere around that age. I had just recently been taught how to break crack down to be able to shoot it. At the time, just being mostly interested in downers, opiates and benzos, I never really did too much cocaine or any uppers besides an occasional couple of Adderall. But once I figured out you could shoot crack, I was pretty much in love with uppers. So one night, I was up late. I had been shooting crack most of the day, by myself, in my room, at my mother's apartment. It's probably two or three in the morning. I just have to say, I love this email, just so you guys know. Yeah. It's probably two or three in the morning at this point. I have just finished off the last of the crack and had no money left, so I wasn't able to buy any more. So now, just spending time to myself, not being able to put all my time and attention to the breaking down and shooting my precious drugs, I realized I was quite high. Now, I realized I was in a sort of psychosis, but at the time, I thought everything was normal. I was level-headed and thinking rational, and thinking rational, ha, ha, ha. Now, my mother's boyfriend and myself were friends at the time, so I thought I heard him plotting to play a trick on me. I thought I heard him telling my mother he was going to take out his gun and pretend he was going to shoot me. This isn't a good trick to play on anyone, and it isn't one that we, we'd in actuality ever play on someone. At the time, though, I thought this sounded normal, but I thought I had the upper hand on him because I heard him plotting this plan. So being slightly trained with the bow staff in karate, I thought I would be able to hide and without him knowing, disarm him or attack and scare him before he had the chance to do so to myself. I had my bow, and I was crouched down, hiding behind the couch for a while, when I'd move to right outside their bedroom door and listen to him talk about his plan some more, so I thought, and then go behind the couch and wait some more. After waiting for about two hours, he finally comes out to get something from the kitchen, but I think he's coming out to execute his plan. So as he walks past the couch, I jump up, smack him right in the hands and run off feeling that I accomplished what I set out to do. Then I hear him screaming, what the fuck? And telling my mother, what the fuck is he doing? He just hit me with a stick and he's got to get out. LOL. I then realized my thinking I may have been wrong. And now I know <laughs> I was definitely wrong, but still laugh about it and many other stories today. Thanks. Stay strong, Dopey Nation and Toodles. Josh from Southwest Florida. If you do read this on the show, feel free to say my name. If you want, if you don't read it, then no problem. I'll try again with another one of my stories. Thank you, Josh, also known as Johnny Socket. This is a great email. I loved it. I wonder if the mother's boyfriend still laughs about it. Yeah, I do too. But this story, by the way. It's a great story. It's also, Two hours, crouching. <laughs> crouching, crouching crackhead, <laughs> hidden tiger, whatever. This, this story, though, it's, it's the essence of Dopey. It's like the dumbest story ever. He hits his father-in-law with a stick, and it's the funniest thing. Yeah. Like, this, to me, I mean, if you find this story funny, I think you understand the show. I think it's, it's great. You also said something to me uh, this weekend that uh, I thought was really interesting because I never hear you talk program or recovery or, or that kind of stuff, but you talked about um, the whole thing. Would you tell that story to the Dopey oh, Nation? When I first went, like my first meeting, and I had been saying to my friends, like when I'd you be, were drinking, when I was drinking, I'd say to my and my friends knew I needed help, and I would say like I need help. Or I said I feel like I'm pouring beer down a hole, I a just bottomless kept, hole, a bottomless hole, and I kept saying that. And I walked into the first meeting, which was. Um, Oh, that midnight on Houston Street. Yeah, which tough, is like tough. It's meeting. a tough meeting, tough room. Yeah, and the first thing I heard, I heard somebody say the whole, the the God shaped hole, the hole, and I heard that at multiple meetings after. But the first time I heard that, I was like, okay, I'm in the right place. They're using the same language I was using in my head, so this must be right. I love that story. And then I went back, like that was like the. Then you went out and you poured liquor down your bottomless hole. Uh, 
Uh, no, I went. My the person who was going to become my sponsor uh, walked me all the way home from there, and I just kept thinking, "When the fuck is he going to get away from me so I can go buy something alcohol?" Alcohol. And he walked me to my door, and I went. I went inside, and I stood inside my building and waited for him to leave. For him to leave, and I went to the liquor store and got some liquor. But then um, that guy wound up being my sponsor, and everything turned out okay. And, um, you know, I don't know if I told you this, but before we went on the trip, I was talking to, I think I said to a bunch of people, I'm going, and, and it, this might be fucked up, so this is me like, um, what is the word? Uh, admitting something yes. I did that might have been fucked up. I said, oh, I'm going down to, the, to this festival with my friend Ray. Mm-hmm. I said, he's a gay singer-songwriter, is what I'd say. And they would all say, well, what is the difference if he's gay or not? And they were right. They were right. Right. Um, but me and Ray, so I apologize. I, I don't, there is no difference. That's the way I describe you for some reason as a gay singer songwriter. You're labeling me. Yeah, I'm labeling you. But that's discrimination. It might be, but it also became the inspiration for a plan I have for Ray to make some serious Dave bucks. Was just telling me his business plan for me. Ray, you know, Ray is a working singer songwriter, but he's not setting the world on fire making money. I'm very lazy. Well, lazy is true. You're, but you, you work a decent amount, and you have a lot of ambition and dreams and talent, mostly. So I had this idea walking back to the car from the Washington Monument. A money-making idea. A money-making idea, a new genre of folk music, which is just going to be called gay folk. Gulk. Or gulk. Ray, Ray wants to, I think gay folk is, is <laughs> gulk is so gross. It just sounds like, like swallowing <laughs> something or, or vomiting, <laughs> gulk. But gay folk... And, uh, and Ray will sing some gay tunes to the gay people, and they say, let's hear a little... Uh, and, then, and then I said... And don't be gone. Well, you're going to play some gay, g- gay gulk, folk? Gulk. He's going to be gulking it up at DopeyCon. <laughs> but then, then Dave came up with my new name. Well, I, was, I, I wanted his name to be Gray Brown or Gay Ray, <laughs> and then Ray wanted to call himself what? G Ray. Yeah, G Ray Brown. G dash Ray. G Ray. G Ray. And I really think it could be a big hit with... Uh, some gay people in Fire Island. No, I reject this. I reject this Why? idea. Why? He was singing stupid. a song. He was singing it's a song. Stupid. He, well, it is stupid. But he was singing a song about like having a young boy to take care of him I for the rest of his life. I was singing in the person of Walt Whitman. I wrote a song singing in the first person character of Walt Whitman. And who Walt Whitman, have, who was a gay he, young man. When he was an old man, he had like this young guy who was like, Kind of his lover and kind of his assistant helped him write the last edition <laughs> of Leaves of Grass. So what do we call that, the lover assistant role? That's a good partner. A lover assistant, what do we call that? I don't know. Lover assistant. Um, but my point is, it was the first gay folk song. Maybe there's more. Dopey Nation, if you guys know of Have any. Have you ever heard of the Michigan Women's Festival? Obviously not. <laughs> what, is the, what is that? It's a huge lesbian folk festival. And they sing lesbian songs? Yeah, no men are allowed. I'm telling you, gay folk, it could totally, totally, it could it, end your painting it's, career. It's existed for like as long as there's so been. So, who's the biggest gay folk artist? James Taylor? Yeah, James Taylor. Give me a, that's not just <laughs> folk. Anyway, thank you very much, Ray. I've had a blast. We're going to go fly out of Ronald Reagan Airport. And the uh, airport. it was quite a journey, right? Yeah. That's a, that's a, we're watching 20 weirdos <laughs> on Segway scooters Segway through the mall in Washington, D.C., all with helmets. D.C. is a trip. It is a weird place. I just bought um, an awesome shirt for my daughter. Uh, it says, nah. It was like a black T-shirt stand, and it just says, nah, and it, and it says, Rosa Parks. In quotes. In quotes. Nah. Like, that's what Rosa Parks You want to go to the le- back of the bus. And she said, Nah. nah. So I like that. D.C. is a trip. You know, the good deals on barbecue, good deals on water. It seems like segways are relatively accessible. So we're going to leave it at that. Stay strong, Dopey Nation. Ray, do you want to say goodbye to the peeps? Stay strong. Please send in voicemails. Send in emails. DopeyCon, October 12th. Ray, J- Gay Ray, <laughs> G Ray is going to be dropping some gulk at DopeyCon. So come check it out. If you guys have t- Listen, here's an important announcement. If you guys have tickets to DopeyCon and you cannot use them, people need to know because other people want to come. There's a waiting list. The entire... Do you want to hear some of the lineup as of now? Okay, so far it's going to be my dad, Chris's sister Arden, um, Gay Ray Brown, fucking me, 
Fucking uh, Nick Flynn, the author of Another Bullshit Night in Suck City. The entire fucking dank recovery crew, including Relapse Row and some other guy, and Tim from Dank Recovery. Dank not to men- Yeah, all those dank meme people. Not to mention Namaste at Home from Philadelphia and Adult Swim. And uh, and did I say Gay Ray was going to be dropping gold? Uh, if this if people start calling me that, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, don't forget it. Just call him G Ray. G Ray. Anyway, stay strong, Dopey Nation. Uh, oh, leave a review on iTunes. That's very important. And I think that's it, right? Yep. Can you think of anything else? No. Nope. Stay go. strong and fucking toodles for Chris. What's up, Dave and Chris? My name's Jake. I'm 25 years old from West Virginia. I just found Dopey about two weeks ago, and it's my favorite podcast of all time. Y'all are hilarious, and it's just gotten me through some really hard times. And though I'm not clean myself, you know, it gives me a lot of hope for the future. Um, I really like Dave's song, and I'm going to do a little cover of it here on my banjo. Hope y'all don't mind too much. I wrote a uh, third verse myself. Sorry about the poor quality. It's just on my phone. And, uh, sorry about the banjos. Things hard to keep in tune. Sit through the uh, big inbox emails. Feel free to play a clip on the show if you want. I, if not, I know it kind of sucks. All right, I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, y'all.